Welcome to Folds and Curves. I'm your host, Mo Cash Kush. Today we have a very special guest, and his name is Alex Connor. He's a PhD student at Rennesleyer Polytechnic Institute, where he's focusing on biological and chemical engineering, specifically on silk proteins. He's using protein engineering and synthetic biology at his startup, Ripely, to focus on the issue of food insecurity and food scarcity and how we can better preserve food for longer periods of time. Anyways, I'm really excited for you all to hear from Alex today. I thought it was a very fun and fascinating conversation. Without further ado, let's get started. Alex, thanks for coming on the show. Happy to be here. Yeah, dude, this is this is going to be fun. Um, so obviously, you know, I'm somebody that likes to keep up to date with some of the innovations and, and some of the new things that are going on in the life sciences. Um, I'm more on the medical side, on the biopharma side, but I always just keep hearing about SynBio, synthetic biology, um, you know, whether it's blogs or podcasts or Clubhouse, I just keep hearing it come up and I'm not really um, up to date on it. So do you mind giving us a... Um, a sort of summary of what is synthetic biology and, and why there's so much hype around it lately? Well, of course I can do that. And, you know, I think that right now what we see in the mainstream news articles and what the average person thinks of biology, it kind of falls into two categories. The first would be what you're involved with. And that would be, you know, vaccines, medications, the more quote unquote, traditional biological routes of science, right? SynBio falls into that second category where it's the next generation, the new innovation of what we do with biology, what we do with biology in terms of applying science to human well-being. And medications, vaccines, things like that, while they are important and they have been here for a while, the new player on the field is SynBio. And to explain it in simple terms, or to uh, explain it in terms of the 10,000 foot overview, is to start at the beginning of biology. All of biology is based around what I'm sure you're familiar with, and many of your listeners are familiar with, the central dogma. DNA becomes RNA, becomes a protein. Those two steps, those three components are the basis of biology as we know it on earth. And that is where SynBio comes into play. For centuries, for decades, a lot of the current place of biology has been sort of at the end of that. You know, we've been looking at small molecules you know, you are a pharmacist, you're familiar with this, small molecules, drugs that interact at the end of this chain, right, uh, to produce outcomes. SynBio is interesting in that, generally speaking, it starts at the beginning. We start with the DNA. Uh, we don't wait for a black box analysis of how a small molecule or or this or that affects the outcome of an organism, the phenotype of an organism, we go to the root of it. We use DNA-based technologies to produce RNAs and ultimately produce proteins or secondary metabolites. And so if for hundreds of years, human health and biological sciences has been focused a little bit more on the outcome, SynBio is interesting in that it is focused at the root. And that's what's fun about it. That's what some people find to be scary about it. That's what some people find to be exciting about it, is that SynBio is about designing DNA to hijack the central dogma, which is DNA to RNA to protein. And that is where we sit. That is where I sit as a researcher. My lab sits as a researcher. We sit at that first peak, that DNA part, we design it, we produce it, and we identify it. And so in effect, SynBio is essentially taking what nature has provided us. You know, you look around, right? 
and you see yourself, you see somebody sitting next to you, you see a plant, you see, you look outside, you see trees, you see all of these things of nature. And we take, we take a look at the first step of that, the DNA to RNA to protein. And that's what we do. We think about ways in which you can design DNA or RNA to produce proteins of value. That's how I like to think about SynBio, is taking a step back from the outcome look of biology and engineering it from the input stance. Okay, so it's kind of interesting because we almost positioned that like traditional biology is medicine and SynBio is like something else. But when I think about what you just described, it, it sounds like almost uh, those techniques are also being used in medicine. Um, so looking at the genome, I, I know there's things, um, you know, such as genome editing or gene therapy. Um, are those also applications of SynBio or is there overlap? Well, that, and you bring up a great question because that is the beauty of what has happened in recent years. And I'm gonna go to the example that is most obvious, the COVID vaccine, right? The COVID vaccine is a perfect example of the emerging world of SynBio, synthetic biology, combining with the established world of medical treatments. Um, you know, the, uh, most of your listeners probably know the COVID vaccine is based on mRNA technology. And if we go, take a step back and look at the central dogma, we go from DNA to RNA to protein, right? So mRNA is right in the middle of that, but it's still in the sphere of synthetic biology. And for a long time, in my personal opinion, you know, you're the expert on pharmaceuticals, but in my personal opinion, a lot of pharmaceutical human health research has kind of focused on outcomes, focused on pulling levers that are a little bit closer to the root of the problem. But what we see with the COVID vaccine is what I think is the future of medicine in terms of attacking things more at the root, addressing problems more at the root. And the mRNA vaccine for COVID is a perfect example of that because in effect, it is a treatment developed from, excuse me, developed from synthetic biology. mRNA, injecting mRNA into human mammalian cells is essentially the same thing that I do in the lab by injecting certain types of DNA or genes into E. coli, this genetic code this nucleic acid material codes for a certain protein production with a desired outcome. And that, and I think it's, it's really interesting and, and really cool that we see the overlap of these two fields coalescing on a historical scale with the current pandemic and the current medical treatments that we're experiencing right now for COVID. So while synthetic biology hasn't been at the forefront of medical treatments for very long, what this represents is that synthetic biology is at the future of many treatments, very many treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Denzel um, on for one of your podcasts previously, and he did a fantastic job of, of really going into detail on some of this, on how genetic therapies in many ways represent the future of a lot of treatments. And I think that the interesting point on that is that it's not just monogenetic treatments that this is the future for but it's other things and viruses, even complex diseases like obesity, heart disease. We're going to see synthetic biology playing a bigger and bigger role in all of these things for many reasons. One of which is that as time goes on, we understand more and more about how the human genome impacts diseases that are as complicated as chronic diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. Um, but you know, more straightforward is what we see right now with the COVID disease, uh, with the COVID pandemic, COVID-19, is that synthetic biology has been applied to create treatments for this that are effective, but even more important than that, in my opinion, quick, very fast, very fast. And that is, I don't think that advantage can be understated. You mean and like think, speed, how long it took to develop the vaccine? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think part of that is because of the sort of like 
you know, global state of emergency, but, but you're right. I mean, I, I don't remember the exact time, but it was something like within 48 hours of the gene, um, the genetic sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus being released, um, where Moderna had a design on paper. And then I think, um, and that design was the, the very same design that, you know, I actually received in my arm and many uh, millions of other people have too at this point. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the time was spent like clearing it through the regulatory processes and doing the clinical trials and um, taking those necessary steps. But, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. In principle, the same exact vaccine that I took was made on paper within 48 hours. Um, so you can imagine, you know, the applications of that. Um, and, and I think just as, as far as your sort of like view of the future of medicine, I think, I think you're definitely right. I think a lot of people within, uh, you know, my world would agree with you. Um, I think there's, there's some debate about the degree to which um, genetic technologies will actually displace, um, you know, small molecules, um, because in many cases, small molecules are very effective, and they've actually, in some cases, outperformed some of these newer technologies. But in other cases, I mean, you're talking about completely intractable conditions that we've never been able to treat, and now we have options for. So it'll be interesting to see how everything plays out. Um, yeah. But I think you're right, for many, for many conditions... Um, we're looking at the future and, and maybe there's well, well, doors we don't up, even know we can open yet. Yeah, yeah. You, you bring up a fantastic point, which is that there is always going to be a place for small molecules. You know, I, obviously I am biased. I work in the field of synthetic biology. I, I want to promote it as much as I can. I love it, right? I'm biased. But at the same time, you bring up, I think, what is the thesis of the state of science right now in terms of small molecules and synthetic biology work hand in hand and they both will always have their place. And the reason for that is biological. The reason for that is biological. If we look at small molecules, and you can confirm this, from my understanding, most small molecules work on a receptor level. They work on a receptor level, you know, SSRIs, whatever it is. They, they function in terms of activating, deactivating agonist, antagonist towards a receptor, right? You can never replace that. That function of a small molecule is unique and in some terms, I think irreplaceable. But function on a receptor ignores the receptor itself. Or in other terms, it ignores protein composition of a cell itself. And where I sit in my research and my work is more in terms of what proteins comprise a cell, what proteins have function in the cell, which essentially goes back to the central dogma, DNA, RNA to protein, right? And so I think what's very, very intriguing about the modern world of medicine and human you know, advancement towards treatment of disease is this combination and this complementary nature of small molecules working in conjunction with understanding of proteomes, receptors, and what is actually going on at the cellular level. And I think that what our level of science has allowed us to achieve at current time is a fantastically robust understanding of small molecules and how to test them, how to understand if they're effective, how to understand their side effects, and how to understand if this should be, you know, branded as a medication that's worthwhile. What we are working on right now, in my opinion, is an understanding of how to understand the genome and the proteome of humans and how that affects our disease progression. And I think both will each hold their place in combating disease, combating human lack of well-being, and both will always have their place. So that's kind of where I stand with things is that the small molecule side of human well-being, I think, is far ahead of the synbio side. And what's fun to be a part of this field right now is that the synbio side is kind of catching up. We're kind of getting there. And, and the COVID vaccine for me is like the, of course, the flagship example of how we're kind of getting there with some of that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, definitely. And it's it's definitely catching up. And um, it um, kind of seems like there's like this evolutionary process where it's just like, you know, one drug comes out, it's better than the old one. The old one gets kind of like uh, cannibalized, if you will. Um, and it's like in evolution, the way I think about it is certain genes or traits maybe have always existed, but they only become dominant or have some sort of like evolutionary advantage as the conditions change. And so this kind of leads into my next question which is like what technological enablers have sort of altered the science environment to allow this advent of um sin bio so like do you have a historical context because i don't think sin bio is like necessarily brand new i think it's just like accelerating faster than it's ever before um i think the obvious answer is like genome sequencing is one thing that's probably advanced the field or allowed all these new innovations to come out. Is there anything else that, you know, you work with in the lab that allows you to, to work on these technologies? So a lot of people think that the innovations that come from SynBio are human centric. And of course, at the end of the day, yes, many innovations that we care about are human centric. But the mistake that a lot of people make is thinking that human-centric innovations in SynBio must come from the human genome. And that's not necessarily true. In the late 70s and the early 80s is really when the revolution happened. Um, I will have to double check these sources, but I believe it was um, several researchers at Stanford uh, in combination with a couple of researchers, I believe in England, kind of developed the first techniques for uses of restriction enzymes, cloning into cells, bacterial cells, and et cetera. Now, what that means is that it gave us the first ever proof of concept platform for introducing whatever foreign recombinant genes we wanted to into bacterial platforms. This is important because there's really the easiest way to produce synthetic biology proteins or recombinant proteins is in bacteria. It's really the easiest way to do it for most recombinant proteins, unless you need extensive post-translational modifications or things like that. But, you know, this happened years ago, decades ago. Um, but as, you know, as is the story of most technologies, it takes some time for those first research discoveries to really reach it to the commercial side or the mainstream side. But where we're sitting now is that myself and my colleagues across the world that work in this field, we have a very efficient platform for producing and analyzing synthetic biology products in microbes, mammalian cells, insect cells, whatever it is, right? I, I mainly work with bacteria, so that's what I focus on. But um, there are companies that can sequence genes in 48 hours. And there are multitude of protocols for producing recombinant proteins of different types. You know, for instance, I work with silk-like proteins and there are tons of protocols out there on how to work with them, how to characterize them, how to produce them. And I think that to answer your question in terms of like what has changed in the past few decades in terms of like the efficiency process is that we have in the same way that computing has gone exponential. You know, I think I read once that the computing power used to reach the moon is like one eighth of what you have in an iPhone, right? It's, yep. it's amazing, right? Yeah, I, I'm sure I'm butchering that, but it's something along those lines, right? I don't know the, the numbers, state. but I know the iPhone is, is way more powerful. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. We have done the same with genetic technology and with synthetic biology technology. You know, I can send off a sequence of DNA and within two days, I have results on every base pair, on how it's arranged, et cetera. And that has pushed this field forward like no one has imagined before to the point that in these bacterial systems or in any cell-based system, we are able to do things that were unimaginable a few decades ago in terms of precision and accuracy. Um, so, 
Does that mean like the logical progression, if it follows the same path as smart, uh, as like semiconductors and computer chips or, or what have you, um, does, does that mean that we'll be um, sequencing genes in our pocket, like on some sort of device that everyone has in their home or anyone who wants one could have in their garage? Um, is it, is the technology advancing at such a pace where this sort of like genetic technology will will become available to anyone who wants it and not just, um, you know, laboratories or people with enough money to buy uh, to, or to have these, uh, you know, genes sequenced or recombinant technology, et cetera, et cetera. Is it going well, that direction? It is. And it, it's already there. It's already there. That's the funny part is it's already there. If you had uh, $200, you could sequence part of your own genome. I mean, this, and this speaks to what we already see in the commercial sector, you know, 24 or what is it? 23 and me, 24. <laughs> I should know how many human chromosomes, right? 23 and me, um, you know, ancestry.com. This speaks to how inexpensive this has become in such a short amount of time. And, and really the only analogy I have is one I've already mentioned about computing in that in the 60s or 70s, if you would have thought about the computing power of an iPhone, that would have cost millions of dollars, right? And now every day somebody walks, at, you know, literally every person walks around with a smartphone or an iPhone in their pocket. And it, it is, it, in some ways, it's kind of eerie. It's kind of strange how genetic technology has kind of progressed at the same rate and the same time frame as computing technology. But if you look back in the 70s and 80s, right, this is the time frame where personal computers were first invented. This is also the time frame where analyzing genomes and genetic sequencing was first given birth. You know, working with plasmids and bacteria was very new and exciting. And here we are in 2021, and this is its equivalent to you know, you know, going to buy a loaf of bread at the store. I mean, I, you can literally send off a vial of DNA to a sequencing vendor and instantly they have results on it. And it's, it's very analogous in that sense. And, and, you know, the idea that somebody's going to walk around though, kind of, you know, addressing your question, the idea that somebody's going to walk around though with, you know, a, an iPhone app that analyzes their DNA, we're a little bit from that. And I really do mean a little bit because you do see things like Ancestry.com or 23andMe analyzing your DNA as is, but we're getting close. We're, we're getting close to totally understanding what your genetic makeup means for you. In terms of what that means for other more complex outcomes, certainly we're more far away. What about but, like... Um, go ahead. Um, yeah, what, what about like creating uh, like molecules in a sort of democratized way. So uh, I forget the technology, but like, is that ability to basically look at it, say you wanna create like some sort of uh, uh, mirror image of DNA at home, like is that technology um, far off in the future? Meaning could you take a sequence of like, not necessarily, well, I guess a DNA sequence would work too, but even like an amino acid sequence, are we far away from being able to design our own proteins at home is sort of where I'm getting at? Well, design your own proteins at home. That's a, <laughs> it's an interesting question. I like this question because I think about it. I think about it about 10 times more than the average person probably does, maybe more than that. But what I will say is that you would be amazed it, how little money it would cost to do that. If you wanted, for instance, you know, yourself in your basement, if you wanted to design a protein and produce it in your basement, you could do that for under a thousand dollars. So really? like, how, like just uh, like a lot of it, <laughs> I'm going to do this. Not a lot of it, not a lot of it. The it would take some skill, some optimization. You may or may not have to do your PhD in, in some synth bio related field to produce a lot of it. But mm -hmm. in theory, if you wanted to make up a completely random novel protein that's a, it never existed, it would cost you about two to three hundred dollars to buy the gene. And then it would cost you a few hundred dollars to buy some type of small like incubator type structure and, you know, a couple bucks to buy some media and some cells. 
But in theory, you could do this for a few less than $5,000. You could do this in your house, right? Yeah. I actually think there's a Netflix show that, that talks about this. It's, it's something about, and they say something very similar to what I'm kind of like outlining here. There's some Netflix show and they talk about how like the trailer to the show is like everyone thinks biological research is in high tech BSL-4 labs run by the government. But the truth is that in 2020, you can do it, you know, with very little upfront capital and and that's like the the trailer of the show and the truth is that that is very true at mm -hmm. the current point the technology it is at it's very true you don't need a lot of upfront cost and you don't need <coughs> excuse me allergy season it's march now you don't need a lot of upfront cost and you don't need even a lot of equipment <coughs> to do a lot of these things um now the other aspects of it, you know, like purifying it, analyzing its properties, of course, you're going to need more specialized equipment for that. But mm -hmm. the interesting thing about SynBio is that, and, you know, I'm going to once again relate it to a bunch of different technologies we see, like whether it's blockchain or things like that. The really interesting thing about SynBio is that it's becoming more and more democratized. And the only thing in my opinion, barring X person from doing a synthetic biology pro, you know, project is skill, is experience. Um, and it's not money. It's not equipment. Those things, it, you know, maybe even equipment isn't a good thing to throw into there because it's, at this point, you can buy genes for a, a relatively cheap price. You can you can buy a small fermenters and cultures of yeast or E. coli for a very small price. The only thing holding back the democratization of synthetic biology, I think, really is just knowledge and skill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's kind of been what I've been immersed in from my PhD. And I know a lot about it. So I know how to make a lot of different proteins and bacterial systems. Um, but it, it, you know, a good example would be like, like a tailor, you know, a, a tailor for, for suits or something like that. You know, the actual upfront cost of being a tailor is very small scissors, sewing machine, fabrics, this and that the upfront cost isn't that, isn't that large. The skill cost is very large though. To become a good tailor, yeah. you need to work for years and years to understand how fabrics fit on the body, how measurements work and this and that. And I think the analogy is very similar to synthetic biology, which I think a lot of people find striking because you hear that term, you hear the term synthetic biology and you think that, oh God, I need a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment to do anything, but mm -hmm. that's actually not the case. And, and that's what's really striking about this field right now. And what I think could potentially have huge implications for its, evol for its evolution. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I would imagine a lot of that skill, um, and maybe not soon, but like, I imagine somewhere down the line, someone comes up with some commercial product that automates some of that skill or makes it easy so that someone who has a baseline understanding can can do this. And, and what I mean is like, looking back at the computer example, uh, you know, computers were always... It, you know, not always, but computers existed for quite a long time before there was in everyone's house. Um, but, you know, there was a time when only hackers like knew what to do with a personal computer. Um, and before that, there was a time where only people who had tons of money could use a computer at all. Um, but like now, you know, you can just buy one. Um, if you don't want to buy one, you could buy the parts like these gaming computers. My 16 year old brother has built his own gaming computer <laughs> and like he's a smart kid, but it's not like he had to know like the electrical engineering behind it. He literally just put it together with instructions. Um, so I, I just wonder if like someone creates some sort of a process or, or automation system where you just need to like, you know, put ingredients in a, in a tube and it does the rest. Um, that's just kind of an interesting thought. But I, I was curious if you uh, had any thoughts about AlphaFold. It's kind of old news, I think like a month or two ago, but... Um, I, I heard some commentary on AlphaFold that, you know, this type of ability to predict with, with, a, with, with a high degree of certainty how proteins fold could allow people to essentially just design proteins to do whatever they wanted. So if you wanted to essentially, like, let's say, you know, it, it could be anything from I want to make fluorescent gel to put in my hair 
so I could have glow in the dark hair. Um, or it could be like some sort of national security threat, like, or it could be a medicine for a personalized medicine for a rare disease that only I have and a few other people in the world have. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you have any thoughts on, on AlphaFold? I don't know much about it. AlphaFold. So I'm, a, I'm assuming it's like a uh, computational program, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it was developed yeah. by, by Google and they achieved some like massive feat as far as predicting from a DNA sequence exactly what a protein looks like. So this is the future of SynBio. And I don't mean that in any understated terms. Like this, this is the future and this is the magic of SynBio. Proteins are miraculously complicated. And I know you know this, but I don't know if all your listeners know it, but for those that work with small molecules, for those that work with, you know, anything unrelated to the depths of proteins, it cannot be understated, the magic of proteins. And I don't use that word lightly, magic. Because it, it, it literally is. If you look at an average protein, it's got hundreds, if not thousands of amino acids. Each amino acid has 20 possible outcomes, right? 20 naturally occurring possible outcomes. That's not even counting the altered outcomes like hydroxyproline and things like that, right? You have 20 degrees of freedom on each residue, 20 degrees of freedom to the nth power, 100 amino acid protein, that's 20 to the 100th. You have an infinite amount of chemical ability, chemical reactivity, folding ability, binding potential. I mean, they are, they are nature's black box. Proteins are nature's black box. You can get a protein to do freaking anything, man. You can have a protein that makes spider silk. You can have a protein that binds to iron as in hemoglobin. You can, I mean, the possibilities are endless with this amount of chemical freedom. Endless possibilities, of course, imply endless outcomes. Endless outcomes implies endless practical applications. And that's great. We could use proteins for all types of stuff, right? And we can talk about that more later, but the limiting factor here is how do you make sense of 20 degrees of freedom at every amino acid? I mean, that is beyond the human computational capacity in my terms, in my opinion. And that is why I think what you just brought up with this computational approach to protein design, this computational approach to synthetic biology, that is the future. Understanding using the power of computing to understand how to design a primary sequence, how to design a production and a purification protocol that produces proteins with certain shapes, certain primary sequences, certain properties for certain outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting developments in the field because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of operating at the tipping point in my opinion, where there are several groups, you know, my own group, my own research group included, that is looking at the computational power of protein analysis, of synthetic biology analysis. And I am kind of at the tipping point of still doing traditional experiments of messing around with primary sequence, messing around with the production characteristics to understand how this and that affects our protein quality. And if we change the design by this, we change the primary sequence by this, how does it affect our protein properties, et cetera, et cetera. But the true future lies in a in starting with a computational analysis of we want a protein to do A, B, and C, you need to design these primary sequences under these production characteristics, potentially even in this host to achieve this outcome. And I think that that is only achieved with computing because it surpasses the capability of just a basic human brain, right? Uh, in terms of just computational load. But yeah. that, it's so exciting to me to see that, you know, I, in my own research group, there's somebody working on a computational analysis of how certain regions 
in the primary sequence of the silk protein affect its mechanical properties. And I think that's truly the future. I think that uh, proteins in general have been underrated in terms of their material applications. We view proteins, the average person views proteins as, oh, I'm going to go lift weights and eat a steak and, and put on some muscle, right? Yeah. Somebody at the next level views proteins as, oh, you know, proteins do a lot of different things. Mem you know, they membranes that take in glucose or, you know, you know, insulin is a protein, it's a hormone. The next level, the third level of people who talk about proteins is where I'm at where we view proteins as the true actuators of life in terms of that anything that happens, me talking to you, this Zoom call happening, all based on proteins on infinitely diverse functions. And those infinitely diverse functions are something that we can take advantage of. So I am extremely excited about the computational path that Synbio is taking. Dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to like insert a meme on this video where it's like level zero, um, <laughs> like the gym <laughs> level. One. You know that meme where like the last <laughs> one is his brain exploding, <laughs> mind yeah, blown. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to do that. But um, I, I guess like you, I, I like where you're going with this, which is like all the different applications. Um, and we sort of started with this too. Um, like it's not, it's not just medical, but there, there is overlap there, uh, which we've already kind of talked about. I also like how you talked about the, the computational aspect, because uh, up until then we had been talking about like, you know, the evolution of computing and, you know, sort of on the tailwinds, the evolution of genetics, um, and synthetic biology, but like really a lot of it, like you said, is powered by computing and, you know, machine learning and, and all of these abilities because, you know, reading and reading all of these omics and genomics and proteomics and metabolomics requires huge amounts of computing power. Um, so glad you brought that up. But, but back to like the applications front, uh, I'm curious about some of what you're working on um, regarding different applications of like, I guess you would call it protein engineering. Is, is that right? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So like, what is, um, what are some of the applications you're working on? So my PhD work and my graduate research work has been focused on, in general, biomaterials, more specifically, silk proteins. So a lot of people probably hear that and they're a little confused S to hear silk and protein in the same sentence, right? Like, you know, what is the first thing you think about when you think of silk? I, I think of like um, like one of those uh, what are those like robes that they wear in Asia like the, like the women in Asia <laughs> kimono wear kimono yeah kimonos yes I think of kimonos kimono, yeah. yes silk. yeah yeah <laughs> you and a lot of people right so the and and this kind of just relates to so much of what I've been talking about in that most people don't understand what a protein is. People hear protein, they think of steak, they think of muscle, they think of like a nutrient, right? They don't realize that protein is everything. It really is. Protein is the collagen in your skin. Protein forms the connections of your neurons, the, the sleeves of your neurons talking to each other. And, and granted, there's a lot of lipids involved with that as well, but protein is the structural basis of any naturally occurring material for the most part, right? For the most part. And so silk itself is a protein. It, it silkworms, the same material that is made, that kimonos are made out of, a silk handkerchief on a suit, right? It is actually a protein-based material. And that is kind of where my research falls in analyzing this material as a practical engineering material for different outcomes. And uh, I do it through a synthetic biology lens, producing mimetic forms of it, synthetic but mimetic forms of it through bacterial systems. Um, and that's kind, of, that's kind of where my PhD project has led me and what I work on right now is understanding how this miraculous naturally occurring material can be engineered and used for practical human applications. Um, and it speaks volumes to the idea of proteins in general. 
the idea that proteins are the most diverse biological molecule that that earth has created uh you know if we look at the the big categories of biological molecules that nature has created on earth we're left with nucleic acids right so that would be dna rna polysaccharides things like uh glycosaminoglycans gags right um and then fatty acids those can be particularly large right you know um you know also in the polysaccharide category would be things like glycogen starch right mm -hmm. but in that fourth category we have protein and proteins have the most diverse function proteins have the most untapped potential in terms of applicability dna and rna are great they are the basis of life dna in particular is extremely stable it's great at doing what it's doing but could you ever design a high performance fiber out of dna could you design a antimicrobial coating out of dna no personally i don't think you could and you could say the same for polysaccharides. I mean, polysaccharides are certainly more diverse and more applicable in their function for humanity. Uh, you have things like chitosan that could potentially have, you know, antiviral properties or, or even, uh, you know, food preservation abilities when they're applied as a coating, but they're still more limited than when it comes to proteins. And, and proteins are, are truly what mother nature has provided us in terms of the ultimate playground of biological materials in terms of property analysis. So, yeah, I think that's, that's interesting. And it's like, so my understanding of like life and how proteins work in life is exactly as you mentioned that, you know, they tend to be more versatile as far as like DNA basically serves one job in humans and other uh, species as well. Um, you know, and, you know, sugars, like you said, have more versatility, um, polysaccharides and proteins by far just do the most variety of, of different tasks, whether they're structural, delivery, transport, um, receptors, monoclonal antibodies, like, etc. There's just so many different things. But is there something like, is there a, like, I understand that that's how they are, but I don't understand, is there a reason why they have to be that way? Like, is there something about the chemical makeup of proteins or the amino acid library versus like the, you know, uh, uh, you know, DNA base library that just naturally or mathematically or for some weird like combinatorial reason has more versatility built into it? Or is yes, that just how it yes. happens to be? No, no, no. Yes. Th you know, this is a great question. This is a great question. I'm sure all the chemistry majors out there are going to love this question because yes, there is a reason for the versatility of proteins versus other biomacromolecules. Let's start with DNA and RNA, right? How many degrees of freedom do you have for those molecules? For each link in the, so let's take a step back. Let's take a step back. What is a biomacromolecule? A biomacromolecule you know, there's many interpretations, but let's view them as polymers. Let's view them as long chains of a certain set of repeating units, right? Mm -hmm. So let's start with DNA. We're going to go back to the central dogma. We'll start with mm -hmm. DNA, the most basic. What do you have? You have A, T, G, and C. Adenine, right. thymine, guanine, cytosine, right? Mm -hmm. You have four bases that comprise DNA four degrees of freedom for each base, right? Yeah. So that's cool. That's cool. Four degrees of freedom. All right. That's great. But each of those four degrees of freedom is pretty much the same. You got the ram nose sugar and the, the nitrogen base, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's a single ring or a double ring, you know, they're, they're relatively similar and they're relatively similar in terms of properties. You, know, you got four of them, you can switch them out, but at the end of the day, they don't have the diversity of properties that you would see in a macromolecule that has more degrees of freedom in terms of their bases. And it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. The the irony or maybe the coincidence of 
evolution in biology is that these macromolecules are designed specifically to do what they do. DNA is not meant to be an actuator. It's meant to be a data holder, a data collector, mm -hmm. a data sender. You know, maybe RNA is meant to be the data sender. You know, maybe that's a better analogy. But, right. you know, similar. So let's move on from DNA to RNA. We see that RNA has the same four degrees of freedom, right? Uh, you know, you have G-A-T-U, or excuse me, G-A-U-C. The thiamine has been switched out for uracil in this case. Um, you know, four degrees of freedom, but still not a lot. And all four of those degrees of freedom are relatively similar. Ram, no sugar, uh, and then the uh, nitrogen base, right? Mm -hmm. When we move on to protein, however, we see this great increase in degrees of freedom. And what's important is that in contrast to DNA, which has four degrees of freedom, four different base pairs, protein has 20. And what's important is that each of those 20 degrees of freedom, in my opinion, is chemically so much more diverse. You know, instead of having these nitrogen ring bases that are relatively similar as in DNA and RNA, in protein, what you have is this so much more complex degree of arrangement, these so much more complex building blocks that proteins are built from. I mean, you have everything from lysine to glycine to alanine. You have these very diverse chemical structures that comprise a protein. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you get this infinite palette of diversely chemically active compounds. And so proteins take the place as this diverse class of actuators of biology. And I mentioned this earlier, but polysaccharides, um, you know, that and fatty acids, those are two other classes of biomacromolecules that we should consider, right? Um, you know, tend to be in some ways polymers, especially things like starch or cellulose, right? They tend to be polymers or chitosan or things like that. Um, same with fatty acids. You know, you can see fatty acids don't necessarily take the form of polymers, but they can all, all often be long chains, especially in uh, mammalian systems where you have things like steric acid or they can be very quite long chains of, uh, of fatty acids attached to a carboxyl acid group. The, the difference is just in, in the degrees of freedom. I mean, I mean, it ultimately comes back to the small units that make up mm -hmm. those molecules. Uh, there's a limited number of sugars in the animal kingdom that can comprise a polysaccharide. And often with several polysaccharides, those sugars are identical. In terms of cellulose, you have the same sugar base binding over and over again to form the polymer. Uh, in terms of, you know, chitosan, you have one or two different sugar bases binding and binding to form a polymer. In terms of fatty acids, you have, you know, a limited number of fatty acids binding to form a triglyceride or binding to form a long chain fatty acid. It's, they are limited in terms of their diversity at the molecular level. But proteins, proteins are the wild west, man. They are yeah. the wild west of biology. They take whatever they want. You want a lysine here? You want a glutamine here? You want a glycine here? We will mix up whatever chemical moieties we want to form whatever crazy shape or active site we want. And in that way, proteins are just this, this platform of unlimited human editing in terms of practical function. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's really interesting. Like, I, I kind of had an inkling that it probably had to do with the degrees of freedom, as you mentioned. Um, and you could probably tell by the way I asked the question, but I, I didn't actually even think about um the fact that each of those functional units is actually quite different versus how it how it is in a polysaccharide or a nucleic acid. Um, but I, and as you were talking, I kind of had another thought, and I wanted to run this by you. Like, it, there's probably another degree too. So not just the number of units um, or number of possible units and the degree to which each possible unit is different from the next. Um, but also, isn't there some sort of like 3D structural component to this where like DNA, you know, forms that classic double helix, but it's not like a double helix that, you know, turns halfway here or can just like choose. I know RNA can form some interesting hairpin loops and th things like that, but but proteins can can like they can um 
so it's not just the degrees to, of freedom where it's like you know a protein of 100 units is like uh what did you say like 100 to the nth powers or no sorry uh i forget what you said but like it's to the hundredth power if you have 100 amino acids so it's it's infinitely large but isn't it also like infinitely rotating bonds and they can interact in different ways at different conditions maybe it's temperature or, uh whatever the case may be is that like 3d environment also a factor here or how is it a yes. factor yes it is 100 percent a factor so i have been talking a lot and so far in this podcast about like the chemical nature mm -hmm. of proteins versus other bio macromolecules versus you know or, or in other words other biologically occurring materials right but these chemical moieties or these these chemical motifs that occur in proteins they affect exactly what you're saying the structure the arrangement of these molecules of these amino acids and in a lot of in in a, a huge amount of biological context that shape that arrangement determines the function the actuator ability of these proteins so I love that you bring up this DNA double helix example because this is a, a perfect way to kind of showcase the difference of other bio macro molecules versus proteins in terms of ability to take structure and ability to have diverse function. If you look at something like DNA, that is possibly one of the most tightly regulated, if not the most tightly regulated biological structure in all of nature. I mean, double helix. That is what it is, double helix. And there are many arguments to be made that evolution has specifically chosen DNA because of those reasons, of its highly conserved structure, its highly conserved nature, and it makes sense. It's at the basis of all biological code and biological function, right? You yep. take uh, the next step in RNA, and like you mentioned, you see a little bit more freedom. RNA can make loops. It can make hairpins. It can do different types of things that DNA might be a little restricted in doing for the most part. And this all goes back to what I was saying earlier about just the degrees of freedom and the chemical composition and the chemical makeup of each base pair of these biomacromolecules and what you see with protein is just this unbelievable ability to form an incredibly diverse amount of shapes at the secondary structure and tertiary structure level quaternary structure level for that matter it can make everything from you know compact fiber-like structures in terms of silk proteins or amyloid proteins that are located in alzheimer's all the way to globular structures with you know specific active sites in terms of enzymatic proteins and things of that nature so mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you had if you had two armies fighting each other right and the first army only had tanks and those tanks all they can do is make a straight line and roll at the enemy, right? That straight <laughs> yeah. line is great. It's powerful, but that's all they can do. But let's say the second army has tanks. They have infantry. They have snipers. They have mortars. They have whatever it is that you've seen in your Band of Brothers episode, right? <laughs> that army can have a tank line. They can have mortars forming an arc around the front line. They can have snipers in the trees. They can have infantry in the, in the, in the, uh, in the trenches. They can have this incredibly diverse structure of military advancement versus the single tank line that's just advancing. And that's kind of the analogy I like to use to explain how RNA and DNA function versus proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love that example. Um, let's, um, let's, let's circle back to, uh, I think, you know, you, you were talking about the silk protein and then we kind of, um, started going back to the fundamentals, which I, I think is important. Um, but I do want to know, like, what, what is so interesting about silk protein? Um, you know, what are your sort of, what is your sort of vision on, on doing some of this research? So silk is interesting for so many reasons. It is, in my opinion, obviously I'm biased, but it is, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating biomaterials that exists. It is tougher than Kevlar. 
tougher than steel, has more tensile strength than nylon or any other synthetic material that you might come up with. And at the same time, it is extremely lightweight, more lightweight than almost any other high performance material you can think of. On top of that, it's extremely biocompatible with the human body, has things, interesting properties like torsional memory. You can twist it and it'll twist back and remember the exact angle it was at. It is a miraculous material. It's weird, it's strange, and it's fun. And that's yeah. what's so interesting about silk. So let me just, um, let me make sure I understand like what, what you just said. So yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what the like engineering structural terms are, but when you think about a bridge, you often see these extremely thick steel wires um, or, you know, other structures, maybe not just a bridge, but, and they usually like wrapped up in this sort of helical structure. And there might be like six of them. And then inside of each of them is like another, you know, whatever, 10 steel wires. Are you kind of like familiar with the structure I'm describing? Um, if you were to make that same structure with silk, it is what I'm hearing that it would be one lighter and two way stronger? Essentially, yes. If you were using steel to make this bridge, which uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, if you can see, city <laughs> of bridges, most of the bridges there are made of steel, to my knowledge. If you were using steel, silk would have, in some ways, exceeding the mechanical properties, but would be one-sixth of the weight. Uh, silk is typically one-sixth of the weight of steel. So, you know, and I think this is a good point to kind of dive into this in terms of silk has been fascinating to researchers because of these mechanical properties. These mm -hmm. mechanical properties have really caught the eye of a lot of researchers like, wow, this material is so tough. It's so strong, but it's so light. And by toughness, what we mean is essentially the amount of energy that a silk fiber can absorb. Now, for those of you that have taken statics or physics classes, you might know what I mean by this. But for those of you that haven't, toughness is a little bit different than tensile strength. Tensile strength is the amount of force it takes to break a fiber. Elasticity is how far a fiber can stretch before it finally breaks. Toughness is the measure of that force of break times the distance of stretch. If you remember back to your physics classes, a force, or excuse me, toughness is a measure of energy, and energy is a force times a distance in that direction. It's a dot product, right? Okay, and that's yeah. essentially what toughness is. And silk is miraculous in that it has an extremely high toughness, right? So that's something that got researchers interested in silk initially. But as the years progressed, what people in the field found is that the truly interesting aspects of silk go far and beyond just these surface mechanical properties. In my opinion, the most interesting aspect of silk is the diversity of morphologies, or in layman's terms, the diversity, the diversity of forms that silk can take. You can turn silk into a hydrogel, into a coating, into a fiber, into an extracellular matrix. And you can turn silk proteins into so many different forms. It is an extremely diverse biomaterial. And it has even been used for optical devices that detect certain wavelengths. It is an extremely diverse material that can be used for many different things. So the field started in the 80s and 90s. You know, this is a miraculously mechanically robust material. Let's investigate it. You know, Spider-Man shooting webs, swinging from them. <laughs> you know, to be honest, that's actually scientifically supported. If you had a spider web that was as thick as what Spider-Man shoots out, you could stop a plane. I'm not joking you. A one pencil thick, and this is probably too thick, a one pencil thick fiber 
of spider silk could stop a 740 jet, 747 jet from falling out of the sky. That's how strong this stuff is. That's how much energy to break spider silk can absorb. Miraculously Jeez. strong, especially when you consider that it's just a protein. It's just a protein. So that's what originally got researchers interested in the 80s and 90s. But then as time progressed, as the researcher research progressed, you realize that not only can this material form such a robust fiber, we can make coatings out of it. We can make medical devices out of it, hydrogels, meshes, optical fibers. You can do so many different things with this material because of its unique composition. And that's where the field is at right now. A lot of modern research is interested in biomedical applications. We even see things related to food coatings and whatnot, things that you would never think silk could be used for, this protein can be used for. And it just speaks to the wider picture of what we've been talking about, about the infinite potential of the actuators of life, the infinite potential of proteins. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you, I think that's, I don't know how, I don't know how to say it any better than that. I mean, you talked about in the same like uh, section, you know, stopping a plane from falling and, and coating food. And those are obviously incredibly, I, I'm sure, you know, it, it requires uh, incredibly different properties to do both of those jobs. Um, or maybe, maybe I'm wrong there, but I would think that. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, I think that's something you're working on too. So let's talk about that. Uh, you know, um, you know, what is the science behind preserving food or, or coatings on food? So, as I mentioned, my research right now at RPI focuses on the design and recombinant production of silk proteins or proteins mm -hmm. that mem are mimetic towards naturally occurring silk proteins, right? And I have a startup company right now called Ripley that is based on a certain application of these silk proteins. Silk proteins can be used to form quite robust coatings on organic material. Organic material in this case being things like fruits or vegetables, right? Silk proteins have a remarkable ability to adhere and coat to a extremely wide diversity of different surfaces, uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, they can do it. Silk proteins really like to attach to surfaces and make a coating. And this is particularly useful for things like food. And my startup, Ripley, is using recombinant silk proteins to coat the surfaces of food to prevent the transfer of gases and water vapor. And what that in effect does is increase the shelf life of food. There's research out there showing that coatings on food made of silk proteins can preserve the shelf life of fresh fruits and vegetables by two times or more. An immense increase in shelf life on fresh food, particularly on foods that other coating solutions can't address, such as greens. Silk proteins can do this. Um, and we've been competing in various business competitions and we've been having quite a lot of success, including investors that we're in talks with to kind of expand the reach of the company and work on our technology. But uh, that is really, you know, one of the main projects I'm working on right now is kind of taking what I've been working on in the lab and, you know, helping to address the huge problem of food waste that we see right now. And, you know, I don't think, I don't think many people that are, as lucky as us to be living, you know, in the U.S., happy and healthy, they're not as lucky as us to really realize how big of an issue food waste is, and it's quite remarkable. Even the United, even in the United States, we see thirty to forty percent of all food that we produce is wasted, completely wasted. I mean, this is food that leaves the farm and never reaches someone's mouth. And the chief reason for this is the just inherently short shelf life of most fresh foods. You take something like a strawberry, something like a tomato, most of what you buy in the grocery store is a fraction of what left the harvest field, primarily due to just the short shelf life. Uh, and what we need right now is to move our agricultural system forward and to address the problems of the 21st century in terms of human population and food supply are solutions to understand how we can take healthy, fresh, whole foods and 
preserve that for the marketplace. And so that's where Ripely has really found our niche in the market and really what our customer discovery has showed us is that with food retailers, consumers, and even a little bit earlier in the supply chain with uh, warehouses and uh, farming facilities, uh, the need to preserve quality food is there, uh, both financially and practically and from a, a moral perspective. Um, and that's really our mission we take on as a company right now is developing these protein-based solutions uh, to keep people healthy, to, to keep fresh food flowing, um, and to do it through the power of protein. And in particular, silk protein is 100% edible and safe to the human body. Silk protein is so safe to the human body that it can even be used in medical devices, including several FDA-approved medical devices that have minimal immunogenic response, something I'm sure you know a lot about, minimal immunogenic response. Um, so it really is a miraculous material that we're trying to bring to the marketplace uh, through what we feel is the, the most lucrative and the, the most impactful application of these proteins. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a great application. I mean, in my family in particular, and I'm, I'm sure uh, other families as well, like rule number one was you got to finish your plate. Like that food is not going in the garbage. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, and that was just something that like I got in trouble for <laughs> as a kid. Um, but, and, you know, as a kid, I was annoyed, but growing up, like it's something I've uh, implemented in my own life just because it, it feels so wrong, like throwing away food. Maybe you shouldn't have cooked so much if you didn't want it. <laughs> like that's sort of what I say to myself. Um so this is this is really important, right? Because the more you can save, the more people who who can't have who don't have access to food. At, le at least this is how I think about it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not a supply issue that there's other reasons people aren't getting food. But in my mind, like if you preserve more food, more people aren't going to go hungry. Um, now, as I and feel free to comment if there's more to it than that. But uh, I guess from like a commercial perspective, who has like the uh, like vested interest in making sure the food doesn't go wrong? Like who stands to lose money and, you know, therefore would be willing to pay for this sort of preservative technology? So this is a great question. Makes me feel like I'm talking to some VCs right now. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what they ask. They ask who's going to make money and why are they going to pay for it? That's all they care about. <laughs> for, no, for yeah, anyone I mean, that's definitely yeah. true. They need their return on investment. But it is intriguing because it's like we know we need it as yeah. a society, but like who's going to pay for it, you know? I'll, I'll say this to anybody listening interested in startups. There's one thing VCs care about who's going to pay for it and why <laughs> that's what they care about. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's a great question. And the truth is, you know, the, and this goes back to the company right now. And I have a, uh, I have two gentlemen with the company right now, founders with the company that are specifically working on what you just asked. You know, they are actively talking to everyone in the food industry, conducting what we call customer discovery and mm -hmm. figuring out where we fit in, why are people gonna pay for this and what do they need? What are their problems? And what we have found is that food waste is potentially the biggest problem that nobody talks about. We have talked to major, national grocery chains that tell us they waste up to $10,000 a day in a single department, whether it's the meat department, produce department, et cetera. The amount of waste is unreal. And it's so bad that shrink, which is a, a fancy term in the food industry for food waste, is the second biggest expense in the food industry behind labor. So labor is your workers, you know, stacking the shelves, moving the carts, right? Your second biggest expense is food waste, second biggest expense. And this has been confirmed by national retailers, including Walmart that we've talked to. Mm -hmm. And that's really the pain, man. That, that, that is the pain that they want to solve. If there is anything that they can buy or they can do that is going to reduce this cost that they have to their business, they are very interested in it. Um, and this has been demonstrated by, by other companies that operate, you know, within our field, such as Appeal, uh, which offers uh, biomaterial-based food coatings similar to how we do, although ours are quite different. 
uh, but they offer biomaterial based food coatings and, and they've seen huge success with, um, with certain retailers, including Kroger, uh, in getting their solution implemented into their supply chain operation to basically, uh, I think they focused a lot on avocados to basically extend the life of avocados. You, you pick an avocado and it has a certain shelf life, right? Uh, but with the appeal innovation or with the ripely innovation, you can extend that two times or more, uh, meaning that you have so much more flexibility in predicting consumer trends, so much more flexibility in managing your supply chain, and so much more flexibility in selling to consumers. And ultimately, it builds a better world for everyone. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, grocery stores are able to have better margins. Consumers are able to have more availability of products. And at the end of the day, more people are able to just get good quality, fresh, whole food. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't want to sound idealistic or, or anything like that, but really that's what's so fun about being a part of the startup and running this company and working with the technology that we're working with is, is uh, I really do believe in the mission and I really do believe in just trying to make the world a better place through proteomic innovations, uh, protein-based innovations, biomaterial-based innovations. And that's really where we derive a lot of our, our moxie from. <laughs> yeah. No, dude, I, I, I feel that a hundred percent. Um, like, I just really love these businesses that, you know, have the right, um, sort of combination of elements, right. Some sort of technological advantage, this, um, you know, the science behind it, um, the, the know-how, the approach, whatever it is that drives the results. Um, and on the other hand, it's this like social element where, um, you know, this technology, this company is, is something that's driving the world forward in a positive way. Um, you know, and, and like these kind of conversations are always debatable, right? Like Amazon's great because now we can all buy stuff at any point, but like, there's also all these negative things, but aside from like all of that nonsense, something that makes the world a better place, uh, in principle like food waste, I think is extremely exciting. And, uh, you know, I definitely want to keep um, an eye on this in your company. Um, I did want to circle back to this, these grocery stores, though. I'm, I'm curious, like, is there a zero sum game here where it's like the grocery store is saving money and then the, um, the farmers or the producers are, are losing money by not being able to sell them food that they shouldn't be buying in the first place because it's going to waste? Or, or is that not happening? No, this is another great question. So as I mentioned, the food industry is huge and super complicated. <laughs> it took us, we've been doing customer discovery in this industry for like 10 months now. And it took us about half that time to just understand how the hell everything works because it is so complicated. And even at a grocery store basis, you will see differences right like Kroger does things differently than Pittsburgh based Giant Eagle does versus Walmart national base right but what we see is that at the producer level the irony is that food waste is not food waste so let's say there is a peach grower peach farmer right in California Florida whatever it is Half of his peaches get attacked by insects. They get a little bit of mold on them, whatever it is. He doesn't want to send those off to the distributor for sales, right? Mm -hmm. He takes those peaches and he plows them back into his field. And it is nature's compost, a natural form of compost that helps him with the yield next year. So he doesn't really have any food waste. Everything that he wastes is somehow incorporated back into his operations, right? Mm -hmm. On top of that, what we see with farmers is that once a shipment of crop has left their field, they don't give a crap about it, man. They want to get that, those, that crate of peaches off, that crate of oranges off, and it's gone. They don't care about it. It's gone. It's not their problem, uh, which makes sense. I mean, if it's your job to manage a field, livestock, pesticides, whatever it is, like if you're managing a field, you don't give a crap once it leaves, man. That's not your responsibility. You know, you got enough to worry about and it makes sense. So the irony is that early on on the supply chain with farmers and even distribution networks is not really where the food waste occurs. It really hits at the retail and consumer level. That's mm -hmm. where we see that massive amounts of food that could be eaten 
massive amounts of food that should be eaten is not. Consumers in America, we have benefited from decades of unchecked prosperity. And if an apple has a blemish on it, eh, it's no good. We don't want it, you know? Yeah. Likewise, at the, at the retail level, you know, if they get a crate of apples that looks a little old, a little, little overdone, they send it back. So it's really at those levels that we see most of the food waste occurring, most of which can be prevented. And hence why Ripely uh, is kind of targeting those markets as where we can apply our innovation. Nice. Yeah, that's a that's a great answer. And I didn't know any of that about um, sort of the way farmers um, reuse their crop. Um, yeah, I want to learn more and more about this industry. It's, you know, obviously central to everyone's everyday life, right? We, we you know, we eat three times a day. Um, but Twice a day if you're me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's right, I forgot. Um, we'll talk about that another time. But, well, you um, don't, you don't our podcast about uh about nutritional biochemistry <laughs> yeah yeah we'll talk about like ketogenesis and all this stuff i, I know you're <laughs> you're big into this um as a as a preview but but i wanted to make a note like i think it's just pretty awesome how um uh, and i think we sort of started this way so maybe we can end on this note um but you know biology has typically been seen as something that is central to the life or sorry to the to the medical sciences biomedical sciences um, drug development, um, you know, you know, medical devices, how how they're going to interplay with with the human body, um, you know, even in even when you think about animals, you probably think about maybe veterinarians, or you might think about uh, livestock, right? Maybe some supplements or whatever to grow more or to grow your your cows and your pigs larger. Like that's typically where biology seems to have um, played a large role, and and also with plants and things like that. Um, but I guess it's just so intriguing to hear you talk about the applications for food preservation, because this is currently a market that, as far as I know, is like dominated by, you know, temperature control and like plastic wrap, right? So to see biology coming in now as taking over part of that market, it's just very interesting because um, it, it really opens up the imagination. Like, why can't my chair be made out of biomaterials why can't my uh, you know what about electronics like can you make a camera out of one? I'm not saying this is all possible but you see where I'm heading like anything uh, in principle could be made out of biologic materials uh, maybe with better conductivity or maybe with better structural properties um, and something as as simple as like food preservation uh, I think really gives a glimpse into where synthetic biology is uh, and how it could it could really dominate um, a lot of things that we sort of take for granted. Again, like our chairs <laughs> or, or what have you. Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Like, are biomaterials just going to start taking over more or less everything in our lives? Is there some sort of basic principle that, that makes them more advantageous than, um, you know, plastics, for example? Well, yes. The short answer is yes biomaterials will take over our lives and the 21st century is going to be that century that this happens the 20th century you know 1900 to 2000 we saw petroleum-based plastics you know one of my favorite bands of all time the velvet underground they used to be called the exploding plastic inevitable and i love that name because it hits the nail on the head as to what we saw over the past 80, 100 years, right? We saw plastics go from this research phase of, whoa, these weird polymeric materials and they can be shaped and formed. And, and now let's make everything out of it. Plastic bottles, plastic cups, plastic laptops, plastic whatever, plastic everything, plastic people, right? Everything is plastic, <laughs> right? And it's great. It's been useful for us as a society. But there's a huge cost to that. And that huge cost only requires a short fly over the Pacific Ocean where you can see a plastic dump twice the size of Texas that's not biodegrading for hundreds of years, right? Mm -hmm. So 
as our technological capabilities progress, as we have moved into the 21st century where we have seen research into silk proteins and the things like polyhydroxy alkanates or PHAs, which can be formed into bioplastics, things like that, we are moving towards the next age of formable, compatible materials that we can use for different things. And I believe that future is biomaterials, whether it's silk or more likely silk and multiple combinations of other biomaterials, collagen, PHAs, PHBs, things like that, or uh, yeast-based myceliums. There's countries out there, or excuse me, companies out there working with myceliums that are like a leather-like material from mushrooms that's completely biodegradable. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the future of how we do materials fabrication in a sustainable sense. The future of how we create mass amounts of usable, moldable, disposable materials without sacrificing so much of what is important to human existence, the environment, our own health. I mean, things like that. I really do think that is what the future holds for us. And, you know, personally, I like to focus on silk proteins for applications related to food coatings and things of that nature. But you don't have to dig far to find the emerging literature on biodegradable plastics that can replace things like uh, plastic bottles and things of that nature. I really do think that's the way we're headed. We just need the technology to catch up a little bit. We just need the idea of large-scale optimized bioreactors to replace the idea of large-scale petroleum-based based plastic processing and things of that nature. I really do think that not only is it the way forward, but it is the only way forward. I mean, whether we are, are on Earth or, or with Elon on Mars or wherever we are, I mean, this idea that we can just continually rely on a system of producing materials that is so unsustainable, I just don't see how we can rely on that in the future. We need to move towards systems that have more of a circular economy to them, more of a circular life cycle to them, which you can only achieve with bio-based materials. So that's, that's my two cents on it. Obviously I'm biased, but that's my two cents. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'll, I'll leave your two cents as the sort of last part of the episode. Uh, I just wanna, you know, the only thing I wanna say is thanks for coming on and thanks for, thanks for building this sustainable future, um, both in terms of food waste, right? Um, and ensuring um, that we're not wasting food and, and sort of having a sustainable food uh, supply chain, but, but also the sustainable uh, future for our environment. Um, I didn't know that there was a dump the two times the size of Texas. That's, that's frightening. Um, In the Pacific Ocean, two times the size of Texas. Yeah, that's, that's terrifying. Um, maybe I'll take recycling a little more seriously now. Um, so... So yeah, just thanks for coming on. If there's any last word you wanted to, to say, go right ahead. Um, that's all I got for you. No last words, just uh, the power of protein. That's what I'll leave everyone with, the power of protein. <laughs> all right. All right. Alex Connor of uh, Ripley, everyone. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please check out the show notes to learn more about Alex, and I'll see you next time.